Welcome to Behind the Muscle Podcast. Today's guest is an IFBB Pro bodybuilder. Today's guest is Matt Kuba. Matt, welcome to the podcast. Hi, how's it going? It's, Glad it's to have going, you here. Yeah, for sure, Matt. It's going great. I appreciate you taking some time to chop it up with me. Um, the first question that I have for you, Matt, is who are a few of your favorite bodybuilders of all time? Uh, well, I actually did my first show in 2004. So when I was kind of getting started in competing, it was, you know, all about, uh, you know, Jay Cutler and Ronnie Coleman. So, um, those would probably be my top two favorite guys, even though they kind of battled it out. I didn't really have like a favorite. I think I just liked the battle, you know, between the two guys. And, uh, obviously I was excited for Jay when he, uh, won and you know was able to beat Ronnie but I still consider Ronnie to be the greatest of all time and um, Jay is a big reason why you know I work with the coach that I do I work with Chris Aceto and Chris Aceto worked with Jay Cutler um, so he was definitely a big influence in you know when I was getting started in bodybuilding. Excellent man that that battle uh, you you uh, just when I was doing a little bit of um, reading up on your bio and stuff just to kind of prep for our conversation uh, you're, you're just a couple years older than me. So, uh, that those battles between, uh, Ronnie and Jay, man, they're, they're, uh, definitely classic. And I, I kind of, I kind of missed that battle. You know, I, at that time of my life, I was, I kind of got tired of Ronnie winning all the time. I kind of got tired of it just being basically Ronnie and Jay. Uh, but now you look back, you know, 15, 20 years later, it's like, I kind of missed those days. They were pretty, they were pretty good. Weren't they? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I still remember some of the other guys, you know, you had like the freaks like Marcus Roll and, uh, you know, Lee Priest was was in the mix. And, you know, I, you know, Gunter, you know, I feel like I could relate a little bit to, to Gunter's physique. He's a taller guy, you know, like myself. I'm six one. Um, so there was still a lot of good guys in that era. But, um, you know, I just, you know, you, you looked at the top two guys for sure. And, it was a battle. So yeah, I definitely miss those days. Absolutely. That was back when I, when I did my first show, I mean, I always joke cause I mean, it was men's bodybuilding, women's bodybuilding and figure. And, you know, I think fitness was still, uh, you know, was around then, but it's just grown so much and changed so much since then. And it, to think, you know, gosh, it's like, I've been competing for 17 years now. It's pretty wild to think how much the sport has evolved and changed over the years. For, for sure. For sure. Yeah. And, and, and I think, uh, you know, just overall the, the fitness industry in terms of the, the competing side of things. I, I think it's in, a, in an, an exciting place because we do have multiple categories. There's a lot more people involved. So um, that kind of leads me to the second question here, Matt. At what age did you start lifting weights? And then why did you start lifting weights at that age? Uh, so I started lifting weights for football in high school. I think it was pretty much that summer before my freshman year. Um, and I probably put on like 20 pounds in a summer or something like that, just because, you know, I, I feel like my body did respond pretty well, you know, definitely better than some of my other peers um, to weightlifting, you know, when I first started. Um, but I was hooked, you know, I, you know, my football teammates, they voted me most dedicated in the off season because like, I, you know, every year pretty much from freshman to senior year, because, the weight room was kind of where I really like enjoyed myself. And, you know, they, they looked at it as like, Oh, training for football. And I viewed it like that, but I mean, I really got into it. So um, I feel like every year it just kind of got more and more. And I actually like during football season, I didn't really train, but um, you know, then it was pretty much right after my senior year of high school was when I decided to do my first bodybuilding show. And you know, that was, uh, that was it for me. <laughs> cool. Cool. And we're, and we're going to get to that first show here in a minute. Um, I like to kind of ask my guests, hence the name behind the muscle, right? Um, I kind of like to ask my guests a little bit about their upbringing, their childhood. You mentioned football. So why don't you just talk about where you grew up? What did those younger years look like? I'm assuming you probably played a lot of sports. Um, just talk about that a little bit. Maybe uh, talk about your parents, maybe their influence a little bit up to high school, and then we'll go from there. Yeah. So, I mean, I played, you know, pretty much every sport you could think of, but, you know, I mean, I didn't really take to soccer, you know, even though I tried it, but I played my, my main sports were football, basketball, uh, baseball, 
And then swimming actually came really naturally to me too. I was more of like a sprinter when it came to swimming. Um, You know, the high school coach even convinced me to do swim team for a couple of years in high school, even though I wasn't really like that into it. I was just good at it and it came really naturally to me. And he was one of those guys that he was just like a good guy. Um, So he convinced me to do it. But anyways, you know, I, you know, played organized football starting when I was in like second grade. And that was probably my biggest passion. I mean, even when it got, when I got into high school, it was like, it was all about football. I I quickly realized that when I got to high school, it was a big high school. I mean, I had like a thousand kids in my class. So I went from middle school to being a really good basketball player and the best basketball player in my middle school to high school. And I was like, on the B team. And, you know, I was decent, but not that good. And so I, I kind of like, eh, all right, basketball is no more. And, but I was, you know, really good at football. And so I started and, you know, both sides when I was a freshman and, you know, our team was really good. We our junior and senior year. We actually had like the best two years in our school's history. Like we made it to the you know quarterfinals as a junior and then the semifinals as a senior um, so we had really good football teams at our school and they've never been back there. Um, our school is not really known for football, but we just had some good teams. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I love football and I actually was, um, uh, going to be going to college to play football, but that was kind of when I was, I, I was going to play division three football. And I guess in my head, I was like, okay, you know, I have division three football where I would have another four years of playing football and I could possibly get injured. And then my you know, career's done. And that was right when I started getting interested in bodybuilding. Cause I was, you know, working out at a, the local like lifetime fitness and there was a trainer there. Um, and he was, you know, brought up the idea of doing a show and it sounded appealing and I kind of had you know I was already committed to going to college and yeah long story short I ended up just saying you know what if I'm not going to play division three football then I'm not going to go to this college and I decided to do a bodybuilding show and my parents were really not for it Um, my parents were very much like you know they were familiar with football they were familiar with baseball and then when I brought up this bodybuilding thing they're like uh, you're going to, so you're going to not go to college and you're going to do a bodybuilding show. Like this doesn't sound like my son is going down the right path. Um, you know, so they made me get a job. They're like, well, if you're not going to college and you have to get a job. So I worked as like a server at Outback Steakhouse and I, you know, did my show in November. Um, and then I ended up going to college in January. So I basically just went like a semester late because I had ultimately made the decision too close to the date. Um, when I was supposed to show up for my freshman year of college, Um, you know, even though I was kind of like battling in my head, but ultimately I just trusted my gut and my, I could tell that my passion was no longer for football. And I had just developed such a strong passion for the weightlifting. um, And that had just grown over the years when I was in high school. And I just, I knew that that, that was what I had to do. And, uh, I just couldn't imagine risking the idea of, of injuring myself and playing football and never giving my chance to, to do bodybuilding. Um, and so, yeah, I, that was, you know, really like my story of like getting, you know, to, to actually do a show and to start bodybuilding. Now, uh, Did you, uh, you know, in high school or anything like that, before you actually did your first competition, Matt, uh, did you like see some of the bodybuilding magazines? Did you have a little bit of an idea of what bodybuilding was before that trainer kind of came up and mentioned that to you? Or when he mentioned that to you, was that kind of the first time bodybuilding came to the forefront of your mind? You know, that's a good question. I, you know, I, I didn't really like, I wasn't like, you know, in super intrigued by the magazines, I I probably didn't really even look at them all that much. I, I think, like I said, at the time, my passion was so much in football, that, you know, that's where, you know, my passion was. And so I was like, in my mind, I was training to get better for football, because my ultimate goal was to play in the NFL. I was like, I want to be a professional football player. Um, I mean, I loved it that much. I mean, I went to the whole speed and conditioning, you know, facility, like I said, I put on muscle relatively easy, but I had to like work my ass off to try to get faster. Cause I played like a, you know, kind of a running back 
you know, tight position where we, we moved in different formations, but it was, you, you know, I would catch the, you know, I would usually catch maybe four or five passes a game and I'd get like five or six runs a game. Um, so I'd get the ball in my hands a decent amount. And I loved that. Um, you know, I probably ultimately would have been more of a tight end position, maybe in, in college, but again, a division three school, I, you know, to play at the next level, I probably would have had to have another couple inches. Um, but, you know, I remember like my peewee, like football coach, there was one guy in particular that, I mean, I'll never forget him. Uh, his name was, gosh, not yet, uh, Mr. Laporte. Um, and so he probably, I mean, I don't know if they'll ever, ever see this, but I remember he, he, you know, he just had like the veins coming down his arms and his muscles. He wasn't like a huge guy, but like his muscles just looked so dense. And, you know, even, I mean, I was probably like in fifth, sixth grade at the time. And I just was so intrigued by that. And I think, you know, that was definitely part of it. And then I think the other thing that I remember was like the Rocky movies, you know, I, you, you, I, I got, you know, hooked on the Rocky movies probably when I was, you know, in high school maybe. And so like that kind of transpired into my training and like that thought process of like kind of being an underdog and, you know, working your way up and, you know, just working your ass off. Um, you know, so those things were very, I would say those two things were probably the two biggest motivators for me. I remember my one coach, Mr. Laporte, and then that, and then the trainer at the gym, like he competed. And so I remember looking at him, like, I, I think when I saw people in person, that was more motivating. And even though they were nowhere near the level of the guys in the magazines, actually seeing it in person to me was motivating. Maybe the guys in the magazine almost just didn't even seem real to me. Um, so that was probably why I was not, you know, super intrigued by the magazines initially. Um, it wasn't until I started seeing it in person. And then actually when I did my first show, then I started watching more videos and, you know, stuff like that. But, and that's why I say like the Jay and Ronnie thing, but you know, the, bigger influences was like the guys you know that I saw in person if I saw somebody at the gym um or the trainer guy Paul Russo was his name um you know those were bigger motivators to me it makes sense now you you said you did your first show at 19 um why don't you talk about that experience and uh you know how did it go um just discuss that prep maybe some some of the things you learned and uh then we'll we'll transition into uh you going back to college to get your BS in exercise science. Yeah. So my first show, it was in 2004. I was 19. So like I said, I started, I basically was supposed to go to college. And then I was like, it was literally probably less than a week before I was supposed to go when I made the decision that, you know what, if I'm not going to play football, I'm not going to go to Carthage college. So I want to go to a different college, you know, a bigger school. And, um, so ultimately, yeah, I decided I was going to do the show and, and start working with, you know, the trainer guy at the gym and he did it like pretty much pro bono. I mean, he didn't charge me for the diet. He didn't charge me for posing. Um, I did my own training. Um, you know, he said, just keep doing what you're doing for training. Um, but he helped me with my diet. I remember we sat down at like a TGI Fridays and I was like, it was like exactly 12 weeks out or something. And he was like, you know, eat whatever you want right now. Cause this is your last cheat meal. And I mean, I literally went from, I mean, I was, you know, thinking like a foot long from Subway was, you know, a good healthy meal to now I went straight into cooking my own chicken and my own rice and everything every day. I mean, I went from literally that to a very extreme bodybuilding diet. Um, but I didn't have any issues with it. I was like, okay, if this is what I have to do, then this is what I have to do. I remember him writing it out literally like on a piece of paper while we were sitting there eating a meal. I don't remember what I ate, but, um, yeah, I remember I, I went to the grocery store, like right after I met with him and he wrote everything down and I was like, okay. And I, you know, told my mom, I come home. I mean, I had never like cooked like this at home before. I mean, I had, you know, I would eat as, you know, I would eat things that I thought were good. Like I would eat yogurt. Like I was like, oh, yogurt has protein in it. And, you know, if I would get, like I said, Subway, or I thought even burgers were good. I was like, well, burgers has meat and it has carbs. That sounds good. Um, you know, and so I was able to do stuff like that. 
Um, so going to an extreme bodybuilding diet where I cooked everything, you know, the chicken, the rice. And um, again, my parents weren't super into the idea. So they were kind of like, okay, well, you have to buy your own food. You have to cook your own food if this is what you want to do. And I wanted to do it that bad that I was like, okay. And uh, so, yeah, I went to the grocery store, cooked all my food and uh, started doing it. And we didn't, we didn't do a single cheat meal the whole time. I think we had like maybe two days of higher carbs where he told me to like eat a banana and eat, you know, a little double the rice in my meals. So it was very like simple. Um, and uh, I, you know, I went from probably like 205 pounds to like 172 pounds at my first show. So about, you know, lost about 30 pounds during that prep. Um, and at six one, I mean, that doesn't sound very impressive, 172 pounds, but I looked pretty good. I mean, when I look back, I was like, you know, I was in good shape for somebody for my first show. I mean, I, I coach people now, so I work with various people and, you know, sometimes it's hard for somebody to get in shape, but I was in good shape. It wasn't like crazy. Um, but overall it was a really cool experience. And obviously, I, you know, I got hooked. Um, you know, I placed fifth and they didn't have a teenage division even. So I was 19. So I was in the men's open division. Um, so being able to place fifth, and I think there was, I don't know, eight or nine guys in my class, you know, it was a decent size show. Um, it was in Rockford, Illinois. It was the Kevin Noble show. And, uh, um, but I had never even gone to a show before that. I, the only thing, my trainer guy that I was working with, Paul Russo, he showed me a video of like one of his shows. And I remember I literally watched it like in the gym, like he set up like a TV in like a, you know, in a room. And he was like, well, just so you have like an idea of what to expect. I was probably like four weeks out from the show. And so I'm just watching like the prejudging of his show and them calling out the poses. And I was like, okay, you know, what's so hard about that? But then you get there and you see like everybody like, sit I got there like super early because, you know, I didn't want to be late. You know, you see everybody with like these really tan faces, just like sitting there like this, like looking like they're like half dead. And I'm like this, you know, pretty excited, like 19 year old kid, like didn't know what to expect, you know and kind of looking around and it was just like a lot of waiting around and you're, you're excited and uh but I you know I went in there with really no expectations I wasn't like you know I'm going in to win the show I was just like I want to compete and you know this is what I got to do and so I think I just always viewed competing it like that too for for a long time was just like you know be the best I can and then the next time try to be better and then the next time try to be better and um, you know, eventually I think that that adds up and, um, that's a good way to approach it. I mean, for some people, they might look at it like, oh, you have to be more confident or competitive, but, you know, I'm very competitive, you know, with myself and I, you know, it doesn't change anything that I do. I mean, I've always done things a hundred percent and, uh, you know, I'm a year round bodybuilder. It's not like I take you know, significant time off. I mean, I eat the same way year round. I train the same way. Um, you know, I have to occasionally force myself to take a week off. Um, but yeah, that first experience, I mean, even just getting my, you know, fifth place trophy, um, it was very cool. And, uh, you know, I pretty much have done a show every year since then. So I think the longest I went was a year and a half in between shows. Um, but yeah, that was my first show experience. Very cool. And, and we're going to, I'm going to ask you about the, your, your competition history here in a minute, but before we do, I do want to touch on, uh, you know, going to college. Cause from, uh, what I, uh, read, you did graduate with a bachelor's degree in exercise science. So why yes. don't you just talk about your college experience, talk about getting that degree. And I would love to know, and this is kind of a fun question. I like to ask my guests, Matt, because you know, a lot, the majority of my guests are IFBB pros or they're top NPC level uh, athletes or, or coaches. And, you know, for people like myself, we see you guys through, through the lens of social media, right? Or, or some other avenue, we kind of see the end product. Um, so I right. love to kind of, you know, ask my guests, you know, when you were going to college, um, what were you kind of thinking in terms of going to get that extra science science degree, what were you kind of thinking that you wanted to be or what you wanted to do with that degree? Um, and then once we kind of chat about that, you share that, 
then we'll uh, we'll get back into that contest history and and go from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean that's an interesting question because <laughs> I guess I just always, you know, I, I feel like I really listened to the people that told me to follow your passion. Um, and my parents probably were not that type as much because they were very scared. Like they they were like, well, what are you going to do with an exercise science degree? You know, why are you studying that? Like, what's you, what's the end goal? You know, my brother he got his master's in science. He he did everything you know by the book. He was straight A student, and they were, they could understand that. But exercise science, they're like, you know, what are you going to do with that? You know, and my parents did pay for my college education, so I did not have to worry about that. They were paying for it, so I understand why they're like, okay, what's the plan? Um, but I guess, you know, I had a few people over the years that just told me, follow your passion. And I knew that I was like, okay, my passion is bodybuilding. And I love this. I knew that there was some way that I could make a career out of it. What it, that was, I honestly didn't know. Um, I just knew that there was nothing else that I wanted to do with my life. And so this is what I'm going to study and I'll figure it out later. Um, and so I just kind of dove in head first and uh, pursued that. Um, and yeah, I guess I didn't really have a, a plan, but, you know, I kind of was, you know, as time went on, I would think in the back of my head and I was like, well, I'll, I'll start off being, you know, a trainer maybe and kind of go from there, see how it goes. You know, I had entertain the idea of like oh you know being a strength and conditioning coach sounds like a cool idea you know I played sports when I was younger um but I was just so you know like I said I was so into bodybuilding that it, all my decisions ended up revolving around that really and it was always like everything that I did was you know, about being the best bodybuilder that I could be. And so, yeah, I ended up, I ended up being a trainer and, you know, now I do the coaching and, you know, that's how I make a living. So, um, you know, it was weird because when I, so I went to college and I initially went to Arizona state was where I ultimately ended up going, but I went there for a year and a half and then, and I wasn't working. I just really wanted to like get away. because I didn't know what I wanted to do. Like I said, I wanted, I didn't want to go to a small college at the time. Cause I was like, well, I don't want to go to a small college and play football. But then I also kind of felt weird going to a small college where I knew I could play football, but wasn't. So I don't know. It was kind of a weird dynamic. So I, that's why I decided just to get away, try something completely new. Ultimately, I ended up graduating from a smaller college, from North Central College, is where I got my uh, exercise science degree. So I did end up transferring back home because um, at the time I got a job basically in the summertime. It was just like it was where my dad worked, so he was able. It was just like working for a transportation logistics company. But they were very flexible with me. They paid me well. You know, I was able to eat at my desk. So my bodybuilding wasn't affected. So, you know, I was able to go to school and I was working, you know, part time there. Um, and so it kind of just made sense. So I was like, you know what, I'll just transfer back home. It's a good situation where I'm able to bodybuild. I'm able to go to school. I'm close to home. Um you know, because again, it, it all revolves back to, you know, bodybuilding, you know, I, if I ever had a job where they couldn't let me eat, you know, I wasn't going to happen. Uh, you know, I worked, like I said, I, for my first show, I worked as a server at Outback Steakhouse and they did a lot. I was eating like back, steak, like back when I, you know, would go back there. And this is the only job that I ever worked at that when I asked them if I could come back, they said no, because <laughs> I probably, they thought I spent too much time eating back there. So it didn't work out, but again, it, you know, was, it revolves back to the bodybuilding. Um, so yeah, I worked at, you know, the office job and I was going to school and uh, um, just kind of making it happen. But then, you know, they offered, actually when I graduated they offered me like a full-time job like you know and it was a decent paying job but I was like you know what I'm like I got my degree in exercise science this job here is not my passion even though I could eat at the desk and, and all that like you know I did not love it I didn't really even like it that much um, it was just kind of I knew it was a middle kind of a job and I was like I'm just going to go and use my degree and be a personal trainer. Um, and so I ended up getting a couple other certifications and, 
I did well as a trainer there at, at Lifetime. I worked there for 10 years um, and now I just do my own thing. Um, but yeah, I think that answered all your questions. I think you said something else, but I forget what it was. No, no, that that's that's perfect, Matt. Um, I, I, now, uh, you, you've said uh, a couple of times that, you know, in regards to like following your passion, right? Uh, mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm, on, I'm on the same level as you. Like I, I own my own gym. The rest of my family's kind of always done quote unquote normal things, you know, and I've kind of always been yeah. the guy that's done, done something a little bit different and opposite. So I'm, I'm right on the same level with you in terms of that. Now, was that, do you feel like that is something that was innate within you in terms of following your passion or, um, because it sounds like your parents were kind of like, Hey, just A, B, C, you know, D kind of go in this direction. That's what you said your other sibling did as well. Um, is that something innate within you, the, the passion thing, or did you, did, did somebody kind of speak that into where, where did that come to be? Cause that's something that you aren't taught in school when we're growing up, right? Like, you know, follow your passion or do what you're passionate about. That usually comes from an outside source. So wh- where did that come from? Or where do you think it comes from for, for you? I don't know. Yeah. Again, that's, that's a good, interesting question again. Um, but, you know, I think we're going back to like when I played football, even. Um, so my older brother did not play football. My older brother played baseball, um, was really good at baseball. He actually played baseball in college. So, again, he, he did all that same you know route and played sports that my parents were familiar with. But when I was first starting to play peewee football, it was actually it was in second grade. So it was relatively early for kids to even play football. And my mom was not really into the idea. Um, I had mentioned it to her. I had a good friend of mine. Um, he was like the only kid like my age that I knew was going to be playing football that year. You know, we played at recess or whatever. Um, and, you know, I told my, my parents, you know, we got to sign up for football. And they're like, OK, you know, we will. And I had signed up for everything else. So I didn't really see it as a problem. But I think my mom was worried about like the danger of football and that like, you know, the hitting. And so basically they just kind of shrugged it off. And the date to sign up like kind of came and went. And like, I don't know, I'm almost getting like emotional, like thinking about it. Because like, I remember like it was just I wanted to play so bad and like I went with my dad, like to the actual, like the head guys, like house. Um, Cause you know, I convinced my parents enough that like, this was what I wanted to do. And I was so passionate about it. And, you know, he signed me up and it was like, it was like past like the date that you were supposed to sign up. And so we start, I ended up getting like a very random number. Cause usually like when you sign up, you get to pick like your top three number choices. So I got number 76. <laughs> and it was just like you know they were like well you know and that, but that was kind of how it started and I think I mean I would tie it back to that is kind of what you know just I became passionate like I think with everything that I did from there on out really I, I love that man not that's super cool because that's that's definitely um it's unique and it's different and I think that's a, a message even for uh, it's a great reminder for myself. It's a great message to the listeners. Like at the end of the day, like, you know, cause I, I've got a bachelor's degree in exercise science and I've done all kinds of odds and ends jobs just to pay the bills. Right. But for mm-hmm. me, Matt, like, you know, it always went back. It's like, man, like I, I love bodybuilding. I love fitness. I love helping people here. You know, it's like, I I'm working this job or I'm working that job, but it's, it's just, it's, it's not again, like what you're saying is I'm not passionate about it. And life is so short. It's like, yeah even if it doesn't make sense in your, your own mind or somebody else's mind that you're close to, or what have you, if it doesn't seem to, to, to fit the mold, like if you're passionate about something, man, like go for it, because even yeah. if you can't make a living from it, maybe immediately or ever, or maybe you do have to work and do something on the side. That's fine. But if you're passionate about something, like that's something that you can do and, and it's going to impact the world. So like, so yeah. go for it no matter what. Right. No, I agree 100%. I think so many people, they just kind of go through life just doing, you know, what they think they're supposed to do, or, you know, the, the way that they think that they're supposed to live. And um, yeah, I feel very fortunate that I was able to go from 
you know, one passion where I had, you know, was football and then I really transitioned right into that next passion, which was bodybuilding. And there was really no like gray area time. It was literally going from one right to the next, um, you know, cause I can't imagine living my life without having something like that. Cause I mean, I pretty much had it since I was in second grade. So for sure, for sure. So yeah. let's get back into your competition history. So your first show was uh, 2004, you're 19. Um, and then you uh, didn't turn pro until 2017 at nationals from my understanding. So why mm-hmm. don't you kind of talk about that wide gap and just some of those, uh, some of those competitions, some of those experiences, just unpack that for us, Matt, please. Yeah. So I guess I just wasn't a very good bodybuilder for a while. And uh, it just, it took me a while to, you know, I have a tall frame, um, getting your pro card. I think when I first started competing, I mean, it didn't even seem like it was in the cards because, you know, and it is, I mean, it is easier nowadays to get your pro card. I mean, there's no doubt about that with all the different divisions and whatnot, you know, there, it does draw some more people into the, the shows, but it also takes away some very good competitors, you know, some guys that, you know, are in classic and do very good, probably could do really well in bodybuilding too, you know, at least up until the pro level. Um, that's when you kind of get your more sharper divides. Um, but yeah, I just kind of was plugging away. I mean, I, you know, I did my first show, I was like 172 pounds, you know, did my next show, I was probably 185 pounds, you know, and probably not even in as, in as good of condition. I think I was in good condition for my first show. I mean, my second two shows didn't really, you know, quite nail it. Um, but I did a couple shows where, you know, I just was working with, I wasn't really paying a coach because I didn't pay a coach for my first show. Um, you know, I had like a friend of mine who would, did pretty well at competing, you know, that he was kind of helping me with my diet. Um, but I guess I didn't take it to the extreme level of focus. I would say, you know, if I did my first show in 2004, I mean, I was, I was very strict. I mean, I literally went like a year and a half without a cheat meal at one point, like literally without a single cheat meal. And I, (laughs) so that's how like intense I was, but I probably just didn't have the best guidance because I didn't have, you know, I was paying for all my food. And so like you said, I was working jobs just to try to pay for the supplements and pay for the food. And I didn't feel like I could afford uh, a coach at the time. So you know, I hired a, I'm trying to think who my first coach even was. Scott Abel was my first coach. Probably most people don't even know the name, but he's a Canadian guy. He helped a few, few guys out in Canada. Um, and he was a pretty big name guy at the time. Um, he helped like Ron Partlow, um, a few other guys, that, you know, get their pro cards. So when I worked with him, I think that was when it probably was in 2000 maybe seven or eight. Um, so that was like three or four years into my competing, you know, and I kind of, like you said, I think you just always kind of try to take it up another level. Um, and you know, so I was working with him and then, uh, yeah, I just kept doing, I just kept doing shows and the goal was just every time I did a show, it was like, all right, to get better than the last one. And at some point I was like, all right, I'm, you know, I want to win my class and be competitive for the overall, Um, but that overall just kind of eluded me. I feel like I, I, I competed in a lot of shows that were, there were some good guys, you know, even, you know, I didn't win my first overall, even a local show until 2015 at the Illinois state. Um, you know, but competing in Illinois, there's some good guys. I mean, even at that 2015 Illinois state, the top three guys in my class at that show ended up getting their pro card within the next five years. So that just goes to show how stacked of a class that was. And I had done some other shows where, you know, I had gotten beat, I think in 2014, I I did a show in Michigan and I got beat by a guy that ended up getting his pro card. Um, You know, he he was in the overall. Um, So, but I think I just always looked at bodybuilding as like a thing that I'm going to do like long-term. So I wasn't overly worried about not placing really well, like right now, um, because I've always viewed it like this is something that I could do for a long time. As long as I stay, you know, relatively injury free and healthy, um, you know, I just want to keep improving. And I feel like if I do that, eventually good things will come. So, yeah. 
Perfect. Now, um, when, when did you uh, uh, connect with Chris Aceto? And uh, why don't you talk about uh, just kind of how he's maybe brought something different or unique uh, to, to the table for you and just what that relationship with Chris is uh, with, with, with uh, yourself and him? Yeah. So, I mean, I've been working with Chris longer than I've worked with anybody else. I mean, I've been with him since 2015. Um, so, you know, that's six, six years now. Um, you know, I had worked with John Meadows before I had a really good relationship with, with John. I had gone out to train with him a few times. You know, I worked with, uh, Jason Theobald, really good guy, still stay in touch, you know, with him time to time. Um, Ken Skip Hill, I worked with him, um, you know, and there was nothing wrong with those guys. They were great. Um, you know, and I think at the time they were good fits for me. And I think, you know, part of me was like, I wanted to learn a little bit. Um, I wanted to get new experiences, but once I ultimately hooked up with Chris, I was like, all right, I'm, I've won an overall at a local show. I've, you know, I had actually done well at like junior nationals. Like I placed second in my class at junior nationals you know, and I knew I was at the point where, okay, now I'm about ready to compete for a pro qualifier show. So I did my first pro qualifier in 2016 with Chris, but, you know, I was like, I want to work with a coach that works with big guys that has a good track record. Um, Cause I feel like my body's actually relatively hard to peak. I think a lot of people like know me nowadays for like, I always bring conditioning and I always nail it. Um, but that was not the case in my first 10 to 12 years of competing. It was, it was always the opposite. It was always like, oh, this guy's pretty big. He's got a good frame, but he just can't nail his conditioning. Um, so it was one of those things that once I really nailed my conditioning in 2015, I feel like it was like lights out. And that's when I won the overall um, at the Illinois State. So I feel like after that, it's just been like easier to get my body there. And Chris is really good at peaking my body and, and reading my body. He's big on like very frequent check-ins. I mean, literally there was a time period last year or the year before, I think it was in 2020 because all the shows kept getting pushed back. Um, and I, you know, I ended up sending him pictures every single day for like seven months straight. I mean, I did not miss a single day of sending him pictures. And that's, I don't know, if you prep for shows, that becomes one of the more tedious things is getting up every day. You know, it's just another thing to do. You got your cardio, you got your workouts, you got your meals, you know, you try to practice your posing, but now you got to do pictures every single day without fail. It, it becomes a lot, but that's how he learns your body and that's how he operates. And so you got to work with, you know, what the coach wants. Um, but yeah, we have a good relationship. I mean, we've, uh, you know, he's been at a few of my shows when I was, you know, doing some of the national level shows like USA's and nationals. Um, and he's been at, at a couple of the pro shows that I've done. If he has other athletes in the show, he'll come to them. Um, but he can't go to all the shows. Obviously there's too many of them and he's got too many guys, but um, yeah, I mean, it, it definitely was, uh, he, he was the right fit for me. I feel like he's got, you know, kind of an old school approach. Um, he's got more of like a basic approach where I, I tend to overthink things at times. And I think he kind of like calms me down and simplifies things. Um, so I feel like we kind of balance each other out in that way. Um, but yeah, I mean, he's definitely brought out the best of me and I feel like I've improved the most, you know, while working with him. Um, so yeah, I'm very grateful for, for, the time working with him. I actually reached out to him. I think it was, I remember sending him the email because I found it like later on, but like I had reached out to him multiple times and he had basically like said he didn't have time, uh, couldn't work with me. Uh, it was over a period of like two years that I probably emailed him like, you know, three, four times. Um, and I think the last time when he finally agreed to work with me he he gave me like a specific date he, it was like I emailed him and he's like oh he's like I don't have time now he's like I remember you though he's like email me on this day or after this day I think is the way he worded it and so I I like wrote that down in my calendar and I emailed him on that day and he was like you're persistent huh? and, he, and I was like yeah and so you know we linked up and you know that was it but he was he was kind of always the guy that I had in my head that like you know, I just held him in such a high regard that, 
you know, I, I'm grateful to have the opportunity to work with him and learn from him. And, uh, yeah, it's been pretty awesome. I mean, nothing against the other guys. The other guys, the other coaches I worked with, some great names there. Um, you know, John was great to me. And, you know, I, a lot of them I still talk to and have, you know, relationships with. So I, I've been fortunate that I feel like to know a lot of really good people in the industry. There's some bad apples with anything, but um, I feel like all the coaches that I've had were all really, really good to me. Awesome, man. Now, uh, why, don't, why don't we talk a little bit about, um, like your, your pro debut, you, you, uh, again, you earned your IFBB pro, IFBB pro card, 2017 nationals. Um, first of all, why don't you talk about that? Just kind of like the emotions, the experience of like, like, man, like I, I, I finally got this, this, uh, this pro card. So talk about that first, talk about your, uh, pro debut. And then why don't you discuss some of those pro shows that you've done and just some of those experiences being an IFBB pro bodybuilder. Yeah. So I knew once I won the overall, like I said, I felt, and then as I won the overall at the Illinois state, and then I placed second at junior nationals. And that was at the, that was the point where I was like, okay, even though I didn't win junior nationals, I felt like I was enough in striking distance where I was like, all right, next year, I'm going to try a pro qualifier for the first time. Um, so I, that was when, you know, I, I was working with Chris and we decided to do junior nationals in 2016. And then we were also going to do USA's. Um, and I actually placed third at junior nationals that year. So I actually went down a spot and I was kind of frustrated and I was like, shit, I'm like, should I do USA's? Like, I'm like, I, I just felt like in my mind, that was like a different level. Um, you know, we had six or seven weeks in between shows then he was like, you'll get better. You'll be ready for USA's. He was super confident. And so I was like, all right. And he was going to be at USA's too. <laughs> and so I feel like I improved a ton during that six or seven weeks. And I placed third at USA's. Um, and the guy that won was a freak. I, I can't even remember his exact name now, but huge, huge guy. Uh, he worked with Palumbo. Um, and then second place was Dorian Haywood, who I've competed against several times now since then as a pro. Um, so it, it was a good lineup. And, uh, but when I placed third at USA is I was like, I'm literally two spots away from getting my pro card. And so at that point I was like, well, I just got to keep showing up, you know, now it's just about finding the right show because there's a lot of really good amateurs that never get their pro card. And it's because they, they, they don't do the right shows and you don't always know what the right show is to do. So the only way to know is to do them. So that was kind of the way that I viewed it. I was like, I mean, everybody's got a different mindset, I guess, and, and way that they look at it. But it was that moment I was like, well, in 2017, I'm like, I'm just going to do every pro qualifier until I get it. Um, so I had my mindset on that going into the year. And so I, I started off with USA's again in 2017. I got third. I did North Americans and that was a really tough show. And I kind of feel like I didn't get a great look. Um, I placed, I think it was seventh, um, but I was in the first call outs. I was on the outside and I felt like they never looked at me. <laughs> so, I, you know, I do think that Seth Shaw, I mean, he looked great at that show and he deserved the win. Um, and I've beat him since then a few times as a pro, uh, but we're good friends. He's a good guy. Um, so, but yeah, I just kind of got on the end and just never got looked at. And I was like, shit, you know, I felt like I moved backwards now going into North Americans. Should I keep going these next few months now and do nationals? And Chris was like, yep, let's go. And so sure enough, we did it. And I, you know, at nationals, it's top two, which I kind of, I don't know. I mean, obviously I got my pro card from placing second at nationals. And it's a little bit bittersweet because you want to win, you know, to get your pro card, but you know, the rules are what they are. And so I was still super excited. You know, I thought I had a chance. I thought it was very close between Chris, me and uh, Chris DiDomonico who ended up winning my class and he won the overall. Um, so I felt good about that. I knew I brought a really good look. I, I thought we were, we were really close. Um, I, it maybe could have gone either way. Um, but I was, you know, obviously to get there and, you know, when a couple of years ago, I mean, literally, you know, you talk in 2014, three years earlier, I hadn't even won an overall at a local show yet. So things did happen pretty quickly. I feel like at that point, um, 
but yeah, it was super exciting. And then I was like, all right, well, now that I got my pro card, you know, I wanted to do a pro show. And so it made sense to do the, a local, you know, there was a Chicago, the Chicago pro was in 2018. Um, and it was about a year later. Um, you know, I always liked, I like to have about a year as a good, like off season. I feel like you get some, you know, give your body a little bit of a break before pushing the diet again. Um, and I did pretty well at my pro debut. Um, I was, uh, I was seventh at my pro debut. Um, and I've had a bunch of, you know, I, I, Kevin Jordan was right ahead of me. And then, uh, I think Sergio ended up winning that show. Sergio Oliva, pretty sure he won or played second. I think he might've played second. And then he went on to play second also at Tampa and then, then, then he qualified for the Olympia. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Cause Michael Lockett won that show. Um, but yeah. And then once I, just placing top 10 in my pro debut, that was super exciting. I feel like even more exciting than my getting my pro card because I was like, wow. Cause I think in your mind, you think like, okay, you get your pro card and now you're at the bottom barrel again, you know, and you got to work your way up, but that's not necessarily the case. I mean, there's plenty of, there's a lot of guys that they get their pro card and then, you know, somebody like Hunter, you know, a couple of years later, he's fourth at the Olympia. Um, you know, that's obviously an anomaly and that's not the case, but usually you kind of, you could get your pro card and the, the NPC is that competitive where you could wind up like right in the middle of the mix. And that's where a lot of these guys kind of wind up. And I think a lot of guys, that, that they either end up in the middle of the mix and they're so used to like winning that it kind of deters them and they fall off pretty quickly. Where again, I've always viewed bodybuilding from like a long-term standpoint. And I know that I still have a lot of good years left in me as, as much as I've been competing. Um, I still feel like my best years are ahead of me. And uh, so I'm just kind of working my, trying to work my way up. I mean, I've been, you know, I've never been in the top five at a pro show yet. Um, but I've been in the top 10 multiple times. I've been outside the top 10, like three times. Um, you know, those were some good shows. Um, like the most recent one was Tampa this last year. That show was stacked like crazy. Um, that was definitely the craziest pro show I've ever been in. Um, you know, but a few, you know, a couple of weeks prior, I was in Chicago, I was uh, eighth. Um, so yeah, I feel like, you know, you, it depends on the lineup and it depends on, you know, I think one of my better looks was at Toronto. I placed eighth um, in 2019. And that was, uh, I feel like I definitely could have been higher. I mean, I, you know, you never like, I don't want to like say anything bad about the judges, um, you know, but I thought that was one of the few shows that I really feel like I nailed it. And I got a little bit overlooked as far as a pro show. Um you know, but you got to work your way up. And ultimately, ultimately I wouldn't have been in the top three, that's for sure. And so if I'm not, if you're not in the top three, you're not really, you know, going to qualify for the Olympia anyway. So it's kind of irrelevant. Like if you're talking about the difference between eighth place and fourth place, even it's kind of irrelevant. So um, I feel like I always tell people like your placing doesn't really matter until you get to the Olympia, because the only reason that you placed what you did is because somebody better didn't show up, you know, if, uh, you know, even if, you know, Phil Heath would come out of retirement and decided to do a show I'm doing next year, you know, I probably wouldn't beat him. You know what I mean? So it would just bump your place back one spot, but, um, yeah, I mean, you just want to try to keep working up and bring the best version of you. And I think if you stay focused on that, that, you know, that's what's going to allow you to be in it for the long term. I mean, I've been competing for 17 years, been pretty unhealthy, been pretty healthy. And, uh, you know, like I said, I've done at least, you know, one show pretty much every year. I've done 28 shows, actually, um, that I did like count them up for. So between my amateur days and pro days, 28 total shows. So, there's probably not that many guys. I mean, yeah, I don't have the greatest like win record, but you know, ultimately my goal is about achieving that, you know, ultimate physique that I have in my mind. And I feel like all those shows are stepping blocks on the way to get there. Um, and so, yeah, they're just all, all part of the journey really. For sure. For sure. Now I want to, we, we, I want to be respectful of your time. We got about 11, 12 minutes left here, Matt. Um, 
I, I want to transition a little bit into talking about coaching. Uh, you had uh, one of one of your clients, one of your athletes, Nathan Epler, uh, just placed fifth place in the in the two twelve at the Olympia. Why don't you talk about that? I saw your post that you kind of put on Instagram about you know just kind of how uh, how proud you were of him and just how rewarding that was for you as a as a trainer as a coach. So why don't you talk about Nathan, your relationship with him, and um, just talk about helping other people. How much how fulfilling it is for you to help other people kind of pursuing their passion within bodybuilding, just like you're passionate about it. What is that like to be, to be able to give back to other athletes pursuing their, their love and their passion um, within fitness and bodybuilding? Yeah, well, obviously, I mean, to make a living at, at anything, you have to give back. So you have to, you know, you have to not only have your passion, but you have to be able to give back. And so that is, you know, important. And I take a lot of pride in that. Um, you know, my coaching kind of just started as, you know, I looked good and I, you know, did a couple shows and people would ask me, I didn't like promote myself as a coach, but you know, if people asked me, I would help them. And then more people started asking me, I started charging them. And then, you know, I started working, you know, with more people and, you know, you start increasing your rate and you start getting, you know, better clients and people that are, you know, you know, word of mouth, getting good referrals, and so it's just kind of one of those things that one thing led to the other. It was not something that like I, you know, dove into. I mean, I, you know, was a personal trainer first and foremost, and I got my degree in exercise science and I had been competing for a few years and, uh, you know, so I just started helping just a small number of people. And as I became more confident in my coaching ability, I started promoting it a little bit more and, you know, started getting, started doing really well with, uh, with a few people. Um, and then, yeah, with Nathan, you know, he's obviously been my most successful client. Um, I started working with him about four years ago, a little bit over four years ago. Um, and I think he had done one show or maybe two shows before that. And he looked, he looked really good. I mean, when he came to me and he sent me his first pictures, I was like, this kid's got great genetics. He's going to do really well. Uh, I mean, bottom line, you know, I'll, I'll put it out there. I mean, if he would have worked with any coach, I'm sure eventually he would have got to this point. I'm pretty confident that I don't know if he would have gotten there as quickly as he did. Cause I mean, he got there very quickly. Um, I feel like we meshed really well together. We have a lot of the same thought processes, you know, at this point we could kind of almost know what each other's thinking. Um, you know, he coaches people himself as well now, um, and yeah, we, the first, like the first show we did, he won the overall, the second show he did, we won the overall, you know, he did junior nationals, won the overall there, which that was a big deal. And that was, that was really cool to me because I was there in person. It was a local show. Junior nationals is like 30 minutes from my house. So it was kind of one of all, always those shows that was like, it was a big show. It was a national level show. So it was a prestigious show. That's why I always like, in my mind, I wanted to win junior nationals. I mean, I did that show one, two, three, four times. Um, I placed second in the super heavies twice. I placed third once and I was outside of, I think I was outside the top 10 my first time that I ever did it. I think Sergio Oliva even was not he didn't even win he was like third or fourth or something like that I don't remember exactly but um that shows you how competitive that was I mean he's a, a multiple time you know he's qualified for Olympia <laughs> um so yeah seeing him win that was was really cool um and then he won his class at USA's and he kind of narrowly you know lost the overall um but then yeah when he was getting ready for his you know pros shows I was very confident in what he was bringing, but you never really ultimately know until you're on stage being compared to these guys. I mean, I remember being at the Indy Pro, which was his pro debut, and it was like guy after guy would walk on stage, and I'm like, man, he looks really good. Man, he looks really good. I'm like, that guy's in really good shape, you know, and but it's not until you start getting compared and you actually start hitting the poses and you're side by side. And to me, it was very clear. I was like, man, he just, he's, he's got it. And, uh, you know, he, he took second at that show and he ended up winning the New York pro a week later. But, um, to me, once he hit that pro debut and he looked like he did in that lineup, I knew he was going to do some damage. And I knew, I mean, going into the Olympia, I was fairly confident that he was going to be top five. And again, it's even, 
as good as, you know, that's like the best of the best guys in the world. So even thinking that I was like, man, am I being like biased here? <laughs> but, um, you know, sure enough, he was able to work his way up there and, and crack the top five, you know, could have been as arguably as high as fourth, maybe, but the top three, I feel like were very clear cut. Um, and I think the judges got it right all around. So, um, but yeah, it was super exciting and I'm excited for, to see what he could do in his future. But I work with a variety of clients. I work with probably 70% competitors and about 30%, you know, just general population people. Um, you know, the people that I train in my own garage gym, you know, are probably majority regular people just with, you know, goals of building muscle or losing body fat, um, you know, and not as many competitors as that, that I work with in person, but online, it's definitely more competitors that I work with. And, uh, but yeah, I, I really enjoy that. I mean, I feel like, you know, obviously to, to make, you know, a good living and I consider that I'm, I, you know, make a good living now. I mean, I'm not rich by any means, but I'm very comfortable. I love my schedule. You know, I love what I do. Um, so I, I feel like I look at it like, you know, I'm not really, I don't know. It doesn't feel like work at times, you know, cause you're just, you're helping people and, you know, it's really rewarding when you, you know, people express their appreciation or when they reach their goals or, um, you know, when ultimately you're just doing something that you enjoy to do and yet they appreciate it so much. Um, I mean, yeah, there's no better feeling. So what, what are, uh, what are, what are you and uh, Nathan's plans uh, then, uh, going into 2022? Have you guys discussed that yet or not yet? Um, we kind of are in the midst of discussing it. I actually assume that top five qualified for the Olympia next year. And so I think the first week and a half after the Olympia, we just assumed that he was just going to do the Olympia next year, but it wasn't until like two days ago, he texted me and I'm still kind of shocked that, that they're, they're saying the top five in the open automatically qualify, but top three in all the other divisions. So he would have to requalify to do the Olympia next year. Um, so we're, you know, planning on doing something later in the year. Probably we haven't, specifically decided but it'll likely be if the olympia is in december next year he'll probably look at doing something in september october time um and then obviously again with the goal of qualifying for olympia but i mean yeah that's the thing making it to that stage i mean getting your pro card is hard enough and then you know winning a pro show or, and making it to the olympia is another thing and to do it repeatedly i mean they make it very hard so um, you know, I'm confident that he'll do it and that we could get there again and, and he'll do really well, but, um, you can't, you can't let up at all. I mean, that's why it's just gotta be about giving it your all every day. I mean, when you start, you know, trying to be like other people, you gotta bring, bring the best version of you. I think so many people like look at bodybuilding and they're like, oh, they, you know, they don't focus enough on conditioning or they don't focus enough on symmetry or they put too much emphasis on size, but really it's the whole, it's the whole package. You have to be symmetrical. You have to be big. You have to be conditioned. And it's the combination of everything that is what looks the best. And, uh, so yeah, that's, but if you just focus on bringing the best you and doing all those things, then, you know, that's, what's ultimately going to be your best look. So the next question here, uh, I could, like two, three more questions and, and we'll, we'll be done. Um, the next question is, when are we going to see you on uh, a pro stage again? So I'm going to do the Indie Pro uh, next year, which is in May of 20. Yeah, next year. And then so it's sets in like the middle of May. And from there, yeah, we'll just take it one show at a time. I do plan on doing more than one show. Um, Chicago, as long as it happens like normal, I mean, it's tough to plan things with these last two years with COVID and whatnot, but um, with everything, how it should be, you know, May would be Indy, July would be Chicago, and then maybe something in between there. I mean, obviously the goal at this point, I mean, I feel like once, I mean, I look at it as it's taking small steps. And I mean, obviously my goal is to improve my own physique. Um, but I got to get into the top five. I mean, that's, that's gotta be the next goal. Um, so I feel almost stupid to say like, I'm going into a show trying to win it when I haven't even been in the top five. It's just, it's not really realistic. 
Um, if I win, great. I mean, but um, I feel like the chances of that are small. I feel like the next step is for me to get into the top five. And if I could do that at more than, you know, one or two shows next year, like if I could place top five, I would keep going and try to earn, you know, accumulate points. Um, you know, the ultimate goal of any bodybuilder is to qualify for Olympia. And so, you know, that's my dream. And, you know, I don't, I know I don't have like freaky genetics and, I, I think I've accepted the fact now that, you know, I've always viewed bodybuilding as a long-term thing, but I've been competing for 17 years. So I definitely have more years behind me than I do ahead of me. And, and that's what I tell my wife. I'm like, Oh, you know, I, I'm probably not going to be competing for another 17 years. I'm like maybe 15, but <laughs> you know, probably not that long either. I mean, as long as I feel like I can improve and I feel like I'm healthy and I still enjoy it. Like I do, I'll keep competing, but I know I have more years behind me. And, uh, so yeah, now, I mean, it's just about trying to get to that Olympia stage. Um, so if I could crack the top five at a few shows and earn enough points, then I would go that route. And then obviously if I'm able to achieve that goal, then the next goal would be to win a pro show. Um, I feel like that's the, the stages that I would kind of view it as. All right. So you just brought up your wife. I wanted to, I wanted to talk about uh, her first name is Jessica, correct? Yes. So why didn't you, uh, that was something I wanted to touch on. I think it's, uh, you know, when anybody has a significant other or, um, you know, kids or anything like that, it's important to me to give them an opportunity to, to talk about that. Cause usually uh, that person or those kids are a big part of their, their life and uh, uh, the process of, of everything they've got going on as an athlete. So talk about Jessica and just kind of what she's uh, uh, meant to you and how you guys just kind of work together in, in life and, and bodybuilding. Yeah, well, I mean, she's uh, she, she's one of a kind. I mean, I, I would venture to say that there's probably no bodybuilders that have as good as I do when it comes to the wife. I mean, so the, the first thing is that, I mean, I told you I won my first overall in 2015. I started dating her like 16 weeks out from that show. <laughs> so, um, you know, that so the first show that she was with me was the first show I won an overall. So she was kind of a good luck charm there right from the beginning. Um, and to start dating me at 16 weeks out from the show. And that was, that year was my most difficult prep that I've ever had. And I, I don't think that that could ever be duplicated when I competed that year. Then I did junior nationals like five or six weeks later. I was like, man, if she can make it through this, she is a keeper. <laughs> and so, I mean, I, I think we went on vacation like shortly after I did junior nationals that year. I ended up proposing to her within three months of that. Um, and then we got married the next year. We got, I did USA's, I placed third in 2016. And then we got married in Mexico like three days later. So we flew back from Vegas and then we went and got married. Um, but she takes my pictures every day. I don't use, you know, people use like the little thing where they do the video thing. You know, she takes my pictures. She's got an amazing eye when it comes to bodybuilding. Literally, like Chris will some like Chris has kind of figured it out over time because he's had enough conversations with her, and he'll be like, "What does Jess think about this?" Or you know, "What does Jess think?" You know, how you look because um, she really does. I mean, there's times where I have my own clients and I'm like, I'm "Like, what do you like?" How I'll, I'll be like, "How far out do you think he is?" Or you know, "What do you think about these picks?" And she. Is she nails it. I mean, she doesn't know necessarily what to do with that information, but she knows the difference between being flat, being, you know, ahead of schedule, being, you know, behind, you know, how the body should look. Um, so she's very involved in, in my competing and just in bodybuilding overall. She competed herself and she did really well in like bikini. Um, that was before we met. She hasn't actually competed since we met. Um, and I, she won't compete again. Um, she just doesn't have the desire to, um, but yeah, I mean, she's been to all my shows. She travels. She literally even applies my tan in the hotel room. I don't usually get, I don't like, you know, the spray tans. Sometimes you're, you're unsure what product they're going to use or how it's going to react on your skin. Like I don't do well with liquid sun rays. Um, but pro tan and Jantana work well on my skin. So, um, we apply that in the hotel room. Um, so yeah, she does everything when it comes to that. Um, but I, yeah, couldn't compete without 
her there with me. It would be, it would be really hard to imagine. Cause I mean, a lot of the track, like, you know, obviously when you compete as an amateur, most of the shows are local. They were in Illinois, Michigan, you know, Wisconsin driving distance. But once you start getting to the national shows and the pro shows, you're traveling for a lot of them. And it could be, it could be a lot, you know, the amount of stuff that you got to bring with you. And, you know, I say, I tell you, I send pictures to Chris every day when we're getting ready for the show, but when you're actually at the show, it might be multiple times a day. And then you're also trying to find a spot that has like decent lighting and it would be really stressful for me. Um, so she takes, you know, all that stress off to me. I don't have to think about anything else about except for what I got to do. Um, so yeah, she's a, uh, she's a special person and, uh, I'm lucky to have her. Yeah, you got a good man, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got it about as good as you you can. I mean, she's just always gotten it. Like I said, my family was never really like into the bodybuilding, and they they've tried to support me. But if you ask my family, like if they could name one other pro bodybuilder, they would probably name Arnold Schwarzenegger, and that's it. Um, you know, they wouldn't even. You'd say Jay Cutler, Ronnie Coleman. They'd be like, I don't know who that is. Um, you know, they nobody literally um so they just don't follow it like that they're not into it where she like when she got into competing even like she was watching like bodybuilding like bodybuilding was kind of what got her you know she ended up doing bikini but she was still very interested in bodybuilding and so she's always been like a fan of the sport and she you know even though she doesn't compete anymore i mean she's very aware of, of what judges are looking for and, and how the body should look. So she's very good at giving me feedback. I mean, it's funny, like literally she'll take my pictures and she'll give me very honest feedback, you know, and it's like 95% of the time, it's exactly what Chris says. And so I always joke with Chris that like, she's my, uh, she's the assistant coach, um, you know, and you know, uh, yeah. Good stuff. La last question here, Matt. Um, for any uh, any listeners that are maybe younger uh, in in the sport of bodybuilding, they're thinking about pursuing bodybuilding. They're thinking about, hey, you know what? Like, I really like lifting weights. I want to pursue my passion. They're kind of connected with what you've shared today in terms of your story. Uh, what what are uh, maybe just some final words that you can leave with those younger listeners or people that are new in the sport of bodybuilding? Just from your own perspective, from your own experiences, what what would you like to share with with those listeners? Um, I think for people that are interested in competing, the first thing that I always say is to just do it, um, commit to a show and commit to the process. And no matter your first show, you should, I don't believe in going into it with really any expectations. I think you just got to do it and see how you enjoy everything as a whole. You'll get to be on, see, how do you like being on stage? How do you like being compared to others? How do you like the extreme structure? Um, you know, I love all that stuff. So, uh, you know, that was very easy for me. I fell in love with that. I didn't feel, feel, fell in love with, you know, I mean, I placed fifth. It wasn't anything like crazy, but it wasn't like, you know, I want, I needed to win my first show. I think you just got to do it. And then from there, you could kind of assess, you know, what your goals are going to be within it. Um, you know, and for me, it was just, you know, okay, I'm going to do another show and try to do better. And I'm going to do another show and try to do better. And at some point I knew I got to the road where I was like, okay, now I want to try to win. And so I think you just got to view it like with that, you know, I think, you know, sometimes with social media, you get a, you start comparing yourself to everybody else and how their process is. And it's very rare, you know, you'll be like, oh, well, this person, they did their first show and they won and, or, or something. And you just gotta, you know, that's not what it's going to be like for everybody. If this is your passion and this is something that you enjoy, you got to chase that passion and you got to just forget what everybody else is, you know, they're how long it takes them or how short it takes them, you know, focus on you and it's good to learn from other people, but you got to focus on your own journey. And, uh, so I always tell people just to, to do a show, um, you know, and, and go through it. Cause I, I think too many people, they, they always say, well, I feel like I'm not ready yet. I feel like I'm not ready yet. And I'm like, if I would have waited until I was ready, I wouldn't have competed for 10 years because I didn't think I had enough, you know, size to compete. You know, I'm comparing myself then to, you know, the, the big boys, you know, that are competing at the Mr. Olympia. 
Um, and sometimes people, they get that in their head that they think that that's what they're going to be competing against. But there's, there's many levels to bodybuilding. And, you know, you start with a local level show, you, you know, you, they have weight classes for a reason. You're, you're not going to be going up against a 250 pound guy. If you weigh 160 pounds, you know, so get on stage, go through the process. Um, you know, if, if you have the, the finances and could afford working with a coach that you trust, you know, find somebody that you, you mesh with. There's not, you know, there's a lot of good coaches out there. Um, and you got to find somebody that you believe in and that you mesh with, because if you don't have that trust, then it's not going to work. But if you trust them and you put hundred percent faith in them and you follow what they say, I'm confident you'll get good results as long as you're working with somebody who's decent. And, you know, from there, you know, you just build on that. You know, I think, you know, the, like, I think when I was, you know, 19, 20, 21 year old, I thought I was working as hard as I possibly could, but you know, even that there's levels to it and you find ways, you know, how do I push myself farther? How do I, you know, be more efficient in the gym at certain exercises and techniques? Um, you know, you learn your body more. Um, and so it's a learning process. I'm still learning, you know, and, you know, when you're new to it, you just got to dive in head first and do your first show and take it from there. Great, great, great words of wisdom. Uh, Matt, uh, uh, I, I want to give you an opportunity if somebody wants to connect with you, um, if, uh, if anybody wants uh, or interested in maybe, you know, the online coach and anything like that, where can people find you? Also, I, I know, uh, you know, All Max is one of your sponsors. If you have any other sponsors or anybody else you kind of want to give a, a, a shout out to, go ahead at this time to share that information with us, please. Uh, well, if anybody wants to get in contact with me about coaching, um, you could reach out to me. Just uh, You could shoot me a message on Instagram. I'll probably direct you to my email. Um, but my Instagram is the easiest. It's just at Matt Kuba. Um, my email is also on there. So you could send me a direct email on there as well. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, my, my sponsors, they've been really, really good to me. Uh, All Max Nutrition, uh, Capital Nutrition, which is a local supplement store. So I always refer my in-person clients to go to Capital Nutrition. Um, and I get my meals from Fresh Basil. Um, they're a, a local company. They don't ship like outside of the Chicagoland area, but if you live in the Chicagoland area, highly recommend, uh, fresh basil. It takes all of the time and preparation out of preparing your meals and they taste great. Um, and you could use my discount code is in my uh, Instagram bio for that. Um, and then, yeah, my, uh, if you need any body work for massages, my guy, massage mayhem, he, uh, he helps me out with my body work. And I think that's important to stay healthy, uh, keep your body running, you know, efficiently. Um, so he does great work. If I'm ever having issues or even just preventative maintenance during prep, I go to see him once a week. So, uh, he's been great. So I've been working with him for like two years. So, yeah. Awesome, man. Matt, thank you so much for taking some time, uh, just to share your story, man, chop it up with me. It's greatly appreciated. No problem, man. Thanks for having me. For sure. Uh, Behind the Muscle Podcast listeners, uh, those of you uh, watching on YouTube, thank you so very much. I always appreciate you guys coming back and uh, just uh, hanging out with all these awesome guests that I'm bringing on to the podcast. Two favors I would ask of all of you. First of all, if you haven't done so already, please hit that subscribe button on YouTube. Why is that important? Because I release all of the episodes of Behind the Muscle Podcast first on YouTube, and then I shoot it out to all the other podcast platforms. The second favor I would ask of all of you, please take Matt's episode, this episode, and share it on all of your social media platforms. Make sure you tag Matt, tag Behind the Muscle, so with that, we know people are listening. People found value specifically in Matt's episode. Again, appreciate that. And then finally, I will leave you all with this. Remember, Behind the Muscle, there's always a story. We'll catch you guys later.